This is Shelton cassette number 24, a talk delivered by Dr. Herbert M. Shelton at the Henry Hudson Hotel in New York City on Monday, July 15th, 1957. According to the guesses of men who call themselves scientists, in order to set themselves off from those of you who don't know anything, mankind has been on the earth for anywhere from a half million to three million years. You can take your choice between the guesses. Civilization is about 6,000 years old. The practice of medicine as an alleged science is a little less than 3,000 years old. Prior to the elevation of the ancient system of magic to the status of a science, there was a period of time of variable length. It may have been 500 and it may have been 900 years long, during which a greater part or a great part of the human race depended upon magic to restore it to health when it became ill. Back of that period, however, whether mankind has been on the earth a half million years or three million years, back of that period, we have no evidence that he had anybody to treat him when he was sick. He lived upon the earth for a half, nearly half million years, or nearly three million years, without physicians, without nurses, without midwives, without psychologists and psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, and without Christian scientists, and without chiropractors and physiotherapists and osteopaths, without anybody to look after him. And yet, he survived. He didn't know anything about germs, and he had no vaccines and serum. He had no penicillin. And he knew nothing of viruses. Nor did he have any surgeons. And he still survived. As a matter of fact, he had done such a good job of it that at the dawn of recorded history, he practically filled all the habitable portions of the globe. He existed here upon this globe of ours in millions. And in some parts of the world, the population was rather heavy at the dawn of history. Now, of course, I know that at the present time, we can't get along without these treatment peddlers and cure mongers of one kind or another. The instinctive practice that what we might term primitive man carried out in looking after himself, both in health and in sickness, are no longer effective. In order for us to get well, we must have some kind of violence done to us. If an animal becomes ill, that animal crawls off somewhere in a secluded spot, goes to bed, rests, stops eating, takes very little water, occasionally crawls out and gets a drink, rest, quiet, fasting with a little water once in a while is the only means that he employs in taking care of himself in order to recover from his illness. 
Primitive man did the same thing. Many people do it today. But today you must have penicillin. Not so long ago, a member of this audience called up a hygienist and he said, is it harmful to take penicillin while fasting? The hygienist replied, is it harmful to take penicillin while eating? And he said, well, isn't it good sometimes? Aren't there cases in which you can use it? This, this little experience reveals to us the difficulty that men and women who have been studying hygiene for a number of years, who have been ha active in local hygienic groups, and who have listened to many lectures and read many books and magazine articles upon the subject, the difficulty with which these people ha uh, labor in their efforts to get away from the brainwashing to which they have been subjected since they were babies on their mother's knee. They're subjected to this brainwashing at home and at school and through the, every medium of information or rather misinformation that this crazy quilt civilization of ours employs with which to misinform and keep in a state of ignorance the people of the country. The needs of the sick organism basically are identical with the needs of the healthy organism. A healthy organism requires air and water and food and light and exercise and rest and sleep and cleanliness and warmth and an equitable or a poised state of mind, one of cheer and hope courage and confidence, rather than one of depression, of hopelessness, and despair. The sick organism needs exactly these same things, but not in the same quantity. In fitting hygienic means to the sick organism, we have to take into consideration the crippled capacity of that sick organism to utilize the organic materials, or I should say to utilize the materials of organic life. If the organism is in such a condition that the power of digestion is temporarily suspended or even greatly impaired, then instead of food from the outside, <coughs> it is necessary that we withhold food from the patient. The common practice in the schools of so-called healing, and there isn't any such thing as a school of healing, the common practice is to feed plenty of good nourishing food to keep up the strength of the patient. How successful this is, how successful it can be, is shown by two broad groups of facts. First, if plenty of good nourishment will keep up the strength of a patient, why doesn't plenty of good nourishment maintain the strength of the healthy one so that he does not become sick? Second, do we not daily see patients fed plenty of good nourishing food to keep up their strength 
growing weaker and weaker and weaker until they finally get so strong that they die of their strength. A few days ago, I attended a meeting, a state meeting, of the Texas Naturopathic Association in Austin, Texas. I got up there and the president of the association said, some of our speakers from out of the state have for one reason or another failed to appear. Would you be willing to take over and give the, the men a talk? And I agreed to do so. And for the first time in their lives, they heard a talk that did not advise them to use drugs in the care of their patients. And one man among them in particular was very much impressed by what I said. I might tell you that I talked to him for two hours. He said, in all the nine years I have belonged to this society, that is the first talk from which I have ever derived any inspiration. I know that there is something wrong, but I haven't been able to put my finger on where it is. The president of the organization then finally got up on the platform and he was telling some of his methods of taking care of patients and among them in a certain type of disease which he said was due to certain food deficiencies, he advocated feeding certain food preparations that are sold on the market. I asked him if the disease is due to a deficiency, how is it that my patients, suffering with the same trouble, get well when I stop them from eating anything and give them nothing but distilled water? After a moment thought, he said, well, the human body has marvelous resources. It has within itself stored substances that when you put it on a fast, and eliminate the toxins, it can utilize those substances and repair itself, heal itself. Then I ask him if it is true that the body possesses stored reserves of the elements that are supposed to be deficient and due to its toxic state is not able to utilize the elements that it has on hand, how are you going to get it to utilize more elements of the same kind by stuffing it on those elements. I'm still waiting for the reply. A sick organism has its powers of digestion and its powers of assimilation greatly weakened or entirely suspended for a greater or lesser length of time. And to feed under those circumstances is to burden rather than nourish the body. It is to poison it rather than nourish it because food that is not digested undergoes bacterial decomposition producing a whole series of toxins, some of which are absorbed into the bloodstream of an already toxic, an already impaired organism to complicate troubles that already exist. If you want your patient to recover, it is necessary that you stop him, either stop him from eating entirely or feed very small quantities within his limited capacity for digesting and absorbing and assimilating food. You wouldn't take a typhoid case or a case of pneumonia out to the track and start him running around the track for exercise. Exercise is one of the needs of life. And yet there are conditions and circumstances in life when exercise could be deadly. When exercise cannot be taken. This is what I mean when I say that you have got to adopt, adapt your hygienic means to the needs 
and the capacities of the sick organism. You do the same with sunshine. You take a person who has never been in the sunshine, who has lived indoors, and who's been clad all of his or her life, and whose skin looks more like chalk than a human skin, and you put them out in the sunshine, and you leave them out for a little while, and in a short time they look like a boiled lobster, and their skin peels, and they itch, and they burn, and they sting. And if you leave them a little longer, serious difficulties result. This is a consequence of overdoing, that is, going beyond the limited capacity of that organism to make use of the sunshine. We have to adapt every article of the Materia Hygienica to the current needs and the current capacities to use possessed by the sick organism. And when we fail to properly adapt those means to the needs of the organism and to the capacities of the organism to use them, we injure that organism. Now the question arises in the minds of many people when these things are presented to them, can we rely upon these normal needs of life upon which we can rely and upon only upon which we can rely in a state of health, can we rely upon them in a state of sickness? Are they sufficient? Are they adequate to restore us to health? Now, actually, they don't restore you to health. Restoration of health is a process, is a biological process that goes on within. These are merely the means that the organism uses in maintaining itself, in repairing itself, in growth, in reproduction, in development, in maintenance, in repair of tissue, in knitting of broken bones. These are the material by which it accomplishes the work, but they don't do the work. To say that food builds the body is like saying that lumber builds the house. Lumber is material out of which a house is built, but let us not overlook the worker. And let us do the same thing in looking at this body of ours. It's all right to feed it, but let us not overlook the worker, which is the living body itself in utilizing food, air and sunshine, water, rest, and exercise, and so forth. Upon the ability of that organism to make use of these things depends your ability to recover health. <coughs> if they're adequate to sustain growth and development, maintenance and repair, in a state of health, then they are adequate, and they are the only materials that are adequate to sustain growth and repair, development and maintenance in a state of sickness. There isn't any other thing that the body can use with which to build tissue, with which to produce secretion, with which to carry on function, than these same elements and materials. It cannot do it with penicillin. It cannot do it with quinine. It cannot do it with streptomycin. It cannot do it with arsenic. It cannot do it with serums and vaccines. It can do it only with all substances and elements of nature that the whole organic world, both plant and animal, have used since the introduction of life upon this earth now use and will continue to use so long as life lasts to build and maintain this animal and vegetable world. Nothing 
that the body is unable to metabolize should ever be taken into it. If a substance is taken into the body that it cannot metabolize, if it cannot transform it, in other words, into flesh and blood and tissue, into bone and muscle and nerve and gland tissue, that substance is not only inadequate, to aid or assist the body in its recovery, it is a positive hindrance, a, de a damaging substance, and should not be taken in. <laughs> to this rule, we make no exception. There are no good drugs. As a matter of fact, any pr valid principle that would give you one good drug could equally give you one million good drugs. Find me a valid principle upon which you can base the use of one drug <coughs> and have that drug be a good drug and I'll show you a principle upon which you can base the use of any drug you want to. Let us then forget penicillin, not worry about whether it's harmful to take while fasting or whether it's more harmful while fasting than while eating. Let us simply abandon penicillin along with the whole pharmacopoeia, the so-called mild drugs, the herbal remedies, and the more violent drugs of the physician. Put them all in the same basket and condemn them all with one blanket condemnation. All, without exception, are poisonous. Some are only lightly poisonous, some are violently so, but not one of them has any business at all in the human body. Even those substances that are so nearly non-poisonous that the body puts up no particular hurried fight against. For example, you might swallow a little common ordinary sand. Even such substances as this have no business in the body. All that, all that can possibly result from taking them in there is a blocking of the channels of life. They have to be removed. They have to be expelled. And the process of removing or expelling them is expensive to the energies of life. So, let us take into our bodies, whether well or sick, only those things that are normal in their relation to life. Only those things that the body can use in building and in maintaining the normal conditions of its fluids and the normal state of its tissues. If we do this, and if we do it within the capacity of the body to use them, then they will be utilized for our good, for our improvement. If we do it the other way, if we decide, well, I need exercise, and we go out and exhaust ourselves by excessive exercise, if we decide that I need sunshine, and we go out and overdo that and burn ourselves and exhaust ourselves even after we have a, acquired a good heavy coat of tan by over-sunning, then we hurt ourselves. I remember a weightlifter that I knew a number of years ago who was a very, one of the very, one of the outstanding strong men of the country, and his wife was a weightlifter also. She was very strong, and both of them were very fond of swimming, and they would go into the water and stay for hours at a time. On one summer, they took a six weeks vacation, and they went went out and rented a cottage on the shores of a lake. And they spent six weeks in the water. 
course, they slept at night time in bed. But they spent most of the day, each day, for six weeks in the water. They enjoyed it. They had a great time. How many of you realize that you often do yourselves more harm by overdoing your good time than you do by some of the more recognizably harmful practices that you carry on? This man required two full years to recover fully from the enervating effect of those six weeks of playing the part of an amphibian, which we are not. Overdoing bathing is not fitting cleanliness or exercise or sunbathing or anything else that you get along with it to the needs of the body or to its capacity to utilize them. And out of such excessive comes harm. Even rest can be overdone. There comes a time when one goes for a rest, when rest ceases to be rest and becomes rust. And then you, the longer you remain resting, the more you rust and deteriorate. There comes a time when activity must be resumed. But when you begin to resume activity, this too must be done within the current needs and capacities of the organism. Fasting can be overdone. We have men in our movement, young men in particular, and I don't blame them because I remember when I went through the same phase, who are willing to recognize no limitations whatsoever upon what can be accomplished by hygienic means. There are limitations. A condition of disease can reach a point where it is irreversible where there is no turning back, where no matter what you do, the patient is going to die. Nobody with any method whatsoever ever has, and it's probable that nobody ever will, succeed in restoring to health 100% of his patients if he takes all the patients that come along. Those of us in hygienic fields are particularly handicapped in this, in, this, in this field, or in this particular, by reason of the fact that most of the patients who come to us have already been through the mill. They've been to all the possible practitioners they can find of the various methods and means of curing disease. They've had operation after operation. They've had injections of various kinds. They've had drugs after drugs. They've been to hospitals and to sanitariums, the pleasure resorts or health resorts as they're called. They've been here and they've been there and they've tried this and they've tried that and they end up under the care of the hygienist after they have lost all hope of finding health through any other channel. And sometimes they actually come in and say to you, if you can't help me, I guess I'm done for. There's nothing else for me to fall back upon. How much wiser it would have been to have resorted to hygiene at the beginning? How much suffering, how much expense would be saved by resorting to hygiene <coughs> when your trouble is small? before it has evolved to formidable proportions, before some of your organs have been removed, before others have been so badly damaged that vital redemption is no longer possible. I, I think I, I've had many people say to me, I won't try to estimate the number, I've had them say to me, you saved my life. 
I would have been dead 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago, except for you. Now, I don't want to claim credit for all this. I only tell you what they say. You know, all of my life, I never restored anybody to health. If I live to be 200 years older than I now am, and continue caring for the sick and advising them, I don't re expect to restore anybody to health in that time. Everybody who gets well restores himself to health. A young lady came in to see me this afternoon, and she said, uh, you've got to make me well. I said, I'm sorry, but that's up to you. You've got to make you well. And you do it, of course, by two simple processes. First, remove all causes that have impaired health. All causes that are maintaining that impairment. Now, I can't do it. I can tell you what's causing it. I can tell you that you've got to stop smoking. I can tell you that you've got to give up coffee. I can tell you uh, that you've got to take a fast. I can tell you that you've got to have more rest. I can tell you a lot of things that you've got to cease doing and a lot of things that, that you've got to do. But after I've told them to you, I can't do them for you. That is the reason that getting well is your own problem. You can't shoulder your burden on to me, nor on to any other hygienic practitioner. And there, there is one of the great fallacies promoted by the schools of so-called healing. Every one of them offers to take your responsibilities upon themselves and bear them for you. Theirs is a kind of vicarious atonement. You sin and they suffer for you. You break down your health, and without requiring of you that you cease doing the things that have broken down your health and that are maintaining you in that broken down state, they will restore you to health. In other words, they will restore you to health without the necessity of removing its cause. It's just as foolish as to think that you can sober up a drunk man while he continues to drink. And the next process in recovery is simple, is equally as simple, it is that of supplying the body with proper quantities and proper proportions of all the primordial requisites of organic life. And these are the things that I have already discussed for you, and by proper quantities and proportions I mean supplying them within the limited needs and crippled capacities for use of that sick organism. And as the condition of the organism improves, so that these things may be supplied in greater quantity, readjustment in their use must be made. I have people ask me, how long do I have to fast? How long do I have to stay on this diet? When will you give me another diet? And so forth. Just as though I could close my eyes or gaze into a crystal ball or something of the kind and tell you just how long tell you in advance just how long it's going to take you to make the improvements in your body that are requisite before something else, some other adaptation or some other change in your program has to be made. When I put a patient on the fast, oh, they always want to know how long am I going to fast. I tell them that you and I are going to know on the same day. Because there isn't any way to predetermine the length of a fast if it's done right. You place the patient upon the fast and you watch the day-by-day -day developments in the case. Sometimes I illustrate this, this thing to the patient by reminding him of the days when he used to take drugs. And I say, 
if you go went if you were to go to a medical man and he handed you a box of Epsom salts and he said, "Here, take a teaspoonful of these Epsom salts every day for six months and you'll be well." Would you go back to him? And usually they say no. <clears throat> the fact is, it doesn't matter what you're doing to a patient or for a patient or what the patient is doing to or for himself. Everything has to be adjusted to the changing conditions of the patient as the changes occur. And this means that the patient has to be watched, he has to be observed. It's not something that you can hand somebody a blanket prescription and say, here, follow this for six months or six weeks and everything is going to be all right. It's not that simple. As simple as the program may appear to you, as I have outlined it to you here this evening, it is still not as simple as all that or as simple as it appears in many cases. Nearly four years ago now, a man in San Antonio came to me suffering with arthritis. He was walking with cane and crutch. He couldn't turn his head from side to side. He had very little use of his arms, and he was bent over in this side. He had to be helped around much of the time. Twenty-seven years he had suffered with arthritis. He was a bacteriologist. He worked in a medical laboratory. He had all the best medical care that the profession could provide. <coughs> he tried everything they had in the drugstore. For 27 years, he continued to suffer. He's not a well man. He's walking without pain or crutch. He's working. He is almost straight. He's about like this at the present time, instead of like this. There are no more pains in his feet. His knees are no longer stiff and painful. His spine is less stiff than it used to be. He can turn his head from side to side a little bit, but he's still improving. It takes time to undo all of the mischief that has been done by a lifetime of wrong living. And time is often the one thing that patients are unwilling to give to themselves. They're not good enough to themselves. So we'll be willing to take the necessary time to recover health. <coughs> a young man came into my place from North Dakota only a few days ago. He says, I'm going to be here a week. <coughs> a week. Sometimes I think they expect us to lay our hands on them and say to them, take up thy bed and walk and have them go out home. All the miracles of that kind that are on record in the world happened either a long time ago or in some out-of-the-way place where you can't check on them. They don't happen in modern life, particularly among educated people and in places where they can be checked on. And yet that seems to be what we're expected to do. A woman came in to me, and the whole of her left breast was gone. She had nothing left there except a large inflamed area that was very red and angry looking, and two or three open abscesses in that red area. And she said, I understand you can cure cancer. I said, I can't even cure a cold. I don't cure anything, and I never did. I'm not in the curing business. But I don't know anything that will remedy cancer. But I'm going to get rid of mine. I said, I hope you do. She said, would you take me for six weeks? I said, no. Why not? Because I can't do anything for you. 
But I want you to take me for six weeks so I can get started, and I'll do the rest myself. I am determined. Well, I took her for three weeks. I compromised with her on that. That's more than two years ago. The woman is still living, and she's still fighting. I don't think she'll ever get rid of her cancer. But I think that she may live for five or ten or twelve years in comfort, in usefulness, and finally die of cancer, as others that I've cared for in the same way have done. There is such a thing as an irreversible state of pathology, as I emphasized a while ago. But in all cases, where recovery is possible, we must give ourselves time. Don't expect instantaneous healing. Don't expect overnight recovery. Don't expect to get well in a week or even in a month of troubles that you've taken 40 to 60 years to build. 